I think one of the interesting things that has happened with the post-2015 consultations is the attention that we are paying to all that was missed out in the MDGs. And that goes just not for issues, but also for measurement. I think there is really new and creative ways of looking at measurement and acknowledging the need to combine measures of vertical inequality with those of horizontal inequalities. And I find the results of this Palmer coefficient very interesting, but I'm really fascinated by why the middle lot don't move. You know, what is it that explains that stability and why is the rise in income of the top lot at the expense of the bottom rather than eating away into the middle? Uh, and I also uh, appreciate the need for multiple measures. I think we cannot capture an income related, rely entirely on income related. I think one of the questions that was asked is what are the acceptable limits to inequality? You know, what is good inequality and when, it, when does it uh, become bad? And I think it is very much related to the extent to which it is a product of circumstances that are within your control or not. Uh, Kevin talked about the way in which inequalities are self-perpetuating through policies and institutions in your graph, the earlier graph, tells us how self-perpetuating it is. Um, but this means that policies and institutions have evolved in ways that it does not require any effort on anybody's part to keep the status quo intact. They will, it will do it by virtue of operating. We've talked a lot about the low-hanging fruit, which was so appealing for the MDGs to claim as a part of meeting the goals. Um, and what this uh, business of self-perpetuation reminds us is we cannot do business as usual, or what uh, Kevin talked about, we need above average effort. We need additional effort and additional push. So I think that it is group inequalities that do pose the greatest challenge, the higher hanging fruit, because it takes us beyond the realm of income and wealth into the more intangible realms of the politics of recognition, dignity, respect, and worth, which development officials have not always been very good at dealing with. I would argue that gender inequalities remain amongst the most pervasive challenges, even amongst those that are disadvantaged by other forms of inequality. Um, we're not really talking simply about different kinds of horizontal inequalities. We are talking about their intersections. And when I think about, when we talked about disability, I think it is absolutely critical to have a gender perspective on this. And it reminds me of some work I did with the BBC around the leprosy campaign in India. How do you make, address the stigma around leprosy? And some of the statistics that came out from that is a reminder of the gender dimensions of leprosy. 25% uh, of women faced with leprosy face restrictions on touching others compared to 15% of men. 39% per on eating with others as compared to 18% of men. 30% on sleeping with other family members compared to 20% of men. 24% on having sexual relations with others compared to 9% of men. 38% on fetching water compared to 15% of men. Many more women were forcibly evicted from their family homes than many more women were evicted than men. The difference between the employment prospects of women with, uh, women with leprosy and women without was far larger than the disparity in employment pr prospects for men with leprosy and men without. So what we are talking about in any form of disadvantage is gender is fundamental to it, and we cannot just gloss it over. Uh, so looking at the material consequences of touching and not touching mm -hmm. and the, uh, and the um, the other kinds of restrictions, what we are looking, what we can imagine not only is the poverty that women with disabilities must face, but also the effects on their self-esteem. Selling inequality is politically much harder to sell than absolute poverty because it casts a light on the haves and the have-nots in a way that absolute poverty does not. Absolute poverty leaves invisible those without. And I think those graphs that Kevin showed of the ridiculous share of income uh, of consumption enjoyed by the top 10% in Nigeria and Zambia compared to the negative shares for everybody else is, is very indicative of why we need inequality. But consumption shares do not convey as vividly as the other indicators of the tragedies that are involved in some of these inequalities, of children dying when they could have been saved, of girls bearing children in an age when they cannot look after themselves, of uh, Dalits being uh, denied ladders into decent employment simply by virtue of their birth. Mm -hmm. Addressing inequality, and this is my last point, is also extremely hard when it comes to gender. Perhaps much harder than some of the less threatening, more threat 
less threatening forms of inequality. Because gender, the gender inequality is foundational to the way in which societies organize themselves. The constant resort to religion, culture, tradition, biology, merit, anything to justify gender inequalities is quite interesting. So th the kinds of in, uh, justifications we seek, I think, vary by income levels. So in high income countries, it will be merit, and in lower income countries, it may be traditional religion or something else. And finally, gender inequalities are hard to challenge because they reach into the most intimate and personal areas of our lives. Even though statistics tell us that it is precisely in these most intimate and personal areas of our lives that women experience the most fundamental forms of discrimination and violence. So I want to conclude by saying we would be failing a major section of the world's population if we do not have a strong stand-alone indicator, a goal on gender equality. Bundling it up with other forms of inequality will not only fail to capture gender-specific forms of injustice around maternal mortality and gender-based violence, but it will provide many policymakers with the alibi that they need to fail to act on gender equality. Very much, and thank you to all our speakers and to you for listening so patiently. Um, I think, Richard, if you don't mind, what I propose to do now is have one round of questions and then allow you to come in because I think what you're going to be very helpfully doing, what you can very helpfully do, is point us at the, towards the end of the conversation to the way forward and to some of the things that we can actually, people here in this room who've heard all this evidence and are involved in this discussion in different ways in terms of actually what we can practically do in terms of advocacy and the effort that you've been leading in the um, thematic consultation on advocacy in this area to start to sort of chart the way forward. So let me start with one round of, I can see three people's hands up, four people's hands up in front of me. Let me start there and then I'll come round to this side of the room for the next round. So uh, Tim, Duncan, and then, um, sorry, if you can just, um, if people can introduce themselves, please, and be um, brief and to the point. 